With the ending of Attack on Titan finally out, the creator of the series, Hajime Isayama, sat down with New York Times, Raphael Motomayer, to talk about Attack on Titan's ending, what the final seasons meant, his involvement in the anime, and a huge revelation that changes what we knew about Attack on Titan. So let's break down the interview and so much more. As well, be sure to check out this article and read it for yourself, links below. If you enjoy Attack on Titan, Jujutsu Kaisen, Demon Slayer, One Piece, or Chainsaw Man, then this is the channel for you. Subscribe and drop a like on the video. Do it for Potato Girl. So the interview begins with Isayama being asked how he feels about the series finally coming to an end. Quote, for this anime to be made and for that to go beyond the borders of Japan and to reach a worldwide audience is something that's been a very happy occurrence for me. In a sense, Attack on Titan has connected me to the world and that's something I'm very glad happened. This series is just so wildly popular and captured so many people's hearts and minds that I bet Isayama went from just being this mangaka in Japan who didn't know much besides what he knew and then suddenly gets thrust into this world where he's probably making tons of money, getting tons of attention, interviews, higher budgets, probably more opportunities. I mean, we also do know as well, Isayama was very hands-on with this anime from as early as episode one and he wrote the script for the final episode. So this man has been able to achieve so much and really, if you think about it, the blink of an eye. The next question though is really interesting and puts to rest one of the talking points that Isayama changed the entire ending of Attack on Titan at the very end. This is actually not the case as the interviewer asks how early on he knew what the ending would be and how much did it change. Quote, that was pretty much there from the beginning. The story that starts with the victim who then goes through the story and becomes the aggressor, that is something I had in mind right from the get-go. Along the way, certain aspects of the story didn't go as expected and I adapted and fleshed out certain aspects, but I would say the ending of the story didn't change that much. So this puts to rest long-standing misinformation from, we'll say, doomers that say Isayama due to air quotes backlash changed the ending. This is not true, as in this interview he states that it was all there from the beginning, and the only things that changed were smaller aspects in the middle of the story, pretty much. While we don't know what these were, we can, say, go back in Season 1, and we'll see a lot of small things that certainly fit this bill. For example, Freckles, Ymir in Season 1, and Season 2 had some moments that did feel off and sort of off the cuff. As well, details like Annie's ability being able to mimic any Titan, yet the ability is really never used in season one or even in the final season at all. Of course, this is all just speculation, but considering how there is pretty much no plot holes in Attack on Titan and only really small mistakes or changes like this, it's quite impressive. It's also very clear if you pay attention to the series that this ending was an Isayama's plan from literally the first scene of the anime. Eren waking up under the tree of Mikasa after having the nightmare he had, which shows details like his mother dying hours before it happens, the smiling titan, the Tiber family royal guard uniforms, which didn't even appear until nearly 10 years later in the final season in episode 4 of part 1. Isayama clearly had this all planned out, and to anyone that says otherwise are clearly either misinformed or are spreading misinformation, likely on purpose. So the next question is a big one. Quote, there's a much talked about scene where Armin, who is struggling with Eren's turn into a mass murderer, seems to thank him for his actions. Can you talk about the meaning behind that conversation? Isayama states, quote, My thinking there wasn't really that Armin was trying to push Eren away for the sake of justice or whatnot. It was more that he wanted to, in a sense, take joint responsibility. He wanted to become an accomplice. In order to become an accomplice, Armin had to make sure that he used very strong wording so that he could take those sins upon himself, and so that was the intent behind it. So if you're wondering the intent of this scene, it's really very simple. Eren and Armin, after both killing countless people, relatively speaking, combined to take joint responsibility for their hellish actions. Despite them both acting as the good guys, Eren withstanding of course, they both killed too many people to justify them rightly as the good guys of this story and cannot allow themselves to live on without that burden of killing countless innocent people. We know what Eren did pretty well, but Armin, if you'll remember, eliminated a harbor and a good portion of a city in the raid on Liberia when he used the Colossal Titan's transformation to wipe out Marley's navy and a good portion of their citizens. 
yes, this was all in the name of, say, winning a war and saving everyone, but Armin and the Survey Corps to do that had to murder the innocent men, women, and children who they were ultimately trying to save in the end. No matter what anyone can say to justify the reasons, it's not really about that, it's missing the point. Justifications mean nothing in this conversation. The fact is Armin killed and Aaron killed. So instead of carrying that weight alone, they'll carry it together to their grave, knowing that they'll both burn in hell for what they did to the world. They are taking responsibility for their actions, pretty much. You have a scene where Aaron apologizes to a kid for the carnage he's going to commit and says he was disappointed in the world he saw beyond the walls. What does that say about his motivation? Isayama, quote, I think that refers to the fact that Aaron was dreaming of going to this world outside of the walls where there was nobody and there was nothing. There was an excitement about this world that was just empty, a clean slate. I don't really know whether that's a good or a bad thing, and I don't really know why that was the ideal that I set up for Aaron as part of this story. But what I can say is that when he does get across the wall at that point, he says he sees that the world is really not that different from what's within the walls in the world that he already knows. I believe that's probably the disappointment that I'm referring to in that specific scene. I love that the interviewer asked this question because it was a very good one. In the final season, part three, the penultimate episode of the series, Aaron breaks down and apologizes for an act he hasn't even committed yet, but knows he will. He expresses his disappointment, and this is because he expected something else, and in reality, what he got was just more of the same. This is also what Aaron was referring to in the episode, The Declaration of War, where he tells Reiner that after all of this time he spent with the people in the internment zone as Kruger, he realizes that through it all, they are the very same as his people on Paradis. So, I was wrong, actually, about my initial interpretation of this scene. Of course, we all make mistakes, but I originally thought he was disgusted by the way people treated the Eldians, which I, I'm sure is the case, because, you know, he factually was, but in reality, what he meant here in this scene was that he expected to explore the world and discover a blank canvas where there was literally no other people. Just vast seas of water, vast seas of fire, forests and land, stretching even further than the forest of giant trees on Paradis and plains and vistas that go on forever. Instead, all he found was more war, greed, famine, racism, and oppression. The nightmare stretched on ever ending, and for that reason, he sought to end the world and basically reset it anew. The next question is really awesome. We need to give the interviewer Raphael Moda Mayor, I hope I pronounced that right, a raise. Aaron says in the final episode of the anime that he had no choice but to follow the future that he saw, that he was powerless against the powers of the founding titan. Armin even asks if he's really free. Was he telling the truth or do you see this as him telling an excuse? In an incredible response, Isayama states, quote, So the truth is, the situation with Eren actually overlaps in a certain sense with my own story with the manga. When I first started this series, I was worried that it would probably be cancelled. It was a work that no one knew about, but I had already started the story with the ending in mind, and the story ended up being read and watched by an incredible number of people and it led to me being given a huge power that I didn't quite feel comfortable with. It would have been nice if I could have changed the ending. Writing manga is supposed to be freeing, but if I was completely free, then I should have been able to change the ending. I could have changed it and said I wanted to go in a different direction, but the fact is that I was tied down to what I had originally envisioned when I was young. And so manga became a very restrictive art form for me similar to how the massive powers that Eren acquired ended up restricting him. This was a super amazing response from Isayama that really enlightened me so much about the entire story. Isayama literally used his own personal experience with Eren to create a meta-like storytelling where Eren and both Isayama wished that they could change the ending of their own stories. Eren wished he could change the ending of the future he saw due to the founding and attack titan's powers acting in unison. Isayama wanted to do the same thing with his own story. But once again, this puts to rest the misinformation that claimed Isayama changed the ending when in reality he was actually so tied down to this ending he created as a kid that he felt the art form of manga was restricting and not freeing like he wanted. So he used those feelings of wanting to achieve freedom as a motivation for Eren. 
in many ways, I'd argue that Isayama's misery brought us one of the most important anime ever created, so I appreciate you. This also does put into perspective why he loves Reiner so much. He and Reiner both go through basically hell only to survive it all at the end of the day and continue on, despite them not really wanting to be tied down to what they are. Also, I think this means that Isayama's next work, which I feel more and more is probably gonna happen because, well, he was disappointed in how strapped down he probably felt to AOT. And well, what better way to rectify those things than to create another series and do it the way he wanted? Now with all of this new experience and knowledge and following from AOT. Obviously this is just conjecture, but it's a thought that I like to put out there to you guys. What would you do in Isayama's shoes? So we have two questions left in the article, and I want to ask you guys if you can drop a like, subscribe, check out my two other channels, one being a weekly seasonal anime podcast called the King of Anime Podcast. Very trash taste style show, lots of comedy, but we also go in depth in the hottest weekly anime news from all around the entertainment sphere. As well, if you loved AOT and you love MAPPA, the studio that created the final season, then check out Chainsaw Man, because I have a second channel where I cover the newest chapters of Chainsaw Man as they drop. I also have a playlist of of all of my videos covering season one on this channel so you can get caught up with the series. Links are in the description and pinned comment. So Isayama is asked, you have been involved in the anime production for a little while, supervising the adaptation storyboards and have been known for asking for changes to the story in the adaptation. Did you personally ask for anything for the final episode? Quote, yes, absolutely. I checked the script, but the main thing was the storyboards. There were different things I suggested. When it comes down to it, it's really the role of the production to make those decisions. But I wanted to at least give my input so that they could take those into account when they were making the final decisions. So this confirms what we've always known, and that is Isayama is hands-on with pretty much every process he can be with production. Storyboards, scripts, suggestions, input, he's always making sure that at the very least, he can give the staff at MAPPA and their support studio, some of which being studios like UFO Table, the studio that worked on Demon Slayer, input and support that will help them create the best version of the story they absolutely can. Some mangaka, when it comes to their adaptations, rarely get this luxury, or some just ignore it and forge on with their manga. Just as an example, you'd be very surprised how popular series like Oshinoko or even My Hero Academia, how much or how little the original creators have involvement in these series. It really does vary person to person. So for the people confused about the message of the ending or saw my original ending explained video and wanted some real concrete proof of what the ending means, Isayama is asked, the manga ends with you showing the future of Paradis and sort of the cycle of war continuing. Is there no end to the conflict in the cycle you present in the story? Isayama says, quote, I guess there could have been an ending where it was a happy ending and the war ended and everything was fine and dandy. I guess that could have been possible. At the same time, the end of fighting and the end of contention itself kind of seems hokey. It kind of seems like it's not even believable. It's just not plausible in the world we're living in right now. And so, sadly, I had to give up on that kind of happy ending. So basically, Isayama didn't want to write a hokey fairy tale ending where war is a thing that gets vanquished. Eren lives and gets the girl, Armin gets the Annie, and Peek becomes my wife. Instead, Isayama went for something realistic and gritty that would speak to the current times we're living in and as well, something that was logical and pragmatic that would speak to the human condition and what we are as people, which is both something beautiful and ugly mixed together. He didn't want to just wash away all those warts we as a collective people bring to this world. He chose the correct and just choice by making us confront the reality of who and what we are by giving us a, well, a kind of a sad, depressing and existential ending where just like always, war continues and humanity as a collective appreciates all the silver linings we can get along the way. This is realistic. It fits the tone of the series and above all else, it doesn't insult your intelligence, though for some, it will insult their feelings. The reason I say this is because many people in media want to be catered to to some degree. We all do. We want to use media as escapism and in this day and age that is as prevalent as it ever was and likely even more now with what we're dealing with in the world. 
Attack on Titan, despite its ultra-dark nature, is escapism to a different world where Titans exist and a bunch of hot people are fighting against evil. People still, even with this series, you know, it, they wanted this fairy tale ending. Or in this case of some outlier fandoms, wanted an ending where 100% of the planet is flattened in there, Fan theories come to life for their anime original ending theory was somehow confirmed and real and even more darker and depressing than it originally is. But I think Isayama chose the road of realism, pragmatism, and honesty, and that fact will offend people and, well, nothing really you can do about it. The truth of the matter is, people don't want honesty and realism when it comes to hard to face topics like this. This interview shed so much light on Isayama's role in the series from his story to the anime's take on the story and it put to rest so much baseless misinformation that I can't help but feel that after reading this I've taken from it a new appreciation for just about every aspect of Attack on Titan and especially Isayama's involvement with any aspect of the story. Anyways, besides all of that, thank you guys so much for making my Attack on Titan ending explain video hit number nine on trending. As I write this, it is currently sitting at number 15. So wow, that is just a huge honor. And I know this will never happen again. So I'm, I'm taking it all in uh, as it's happening and, it, and it's just crazy. So if you're new to my channel, thank you all so much. I cover tons of the hottest new anime like Jujutsu Kaisen, Demon Slayer, One Piece, Chainsaw Man, amongst a bunch of other series. So if this interests you and you like this idea, then please drop a like subscribe to the channel and, and check me out. Financially support the channel by becoming a patron where you'll gain access to my mega One Piece arc reviews and first impressions early. Thank you so much for the years of support. I love you all.